to I'm gonna start now. I'm gonna start now. Hello, welcome to 3CT's Book Salon. I'm Lisa Wadeen, and it's a pleasure to introduce Bob Meister and to celebrate his extraordinary new book, Justice is an Option, a Democratic Theory of Finance for the 21st Century. That's University of Chicago Press 2021. Robert Meister is a professor of social and political thought in the history of consciousness department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's also a visiting research scholar at 3CT, sponsored by the University of Chicago's Department of Political Science. In seminars, workshops, and in lecture hall on this campus, Bob Meister's discussions of neoliberalism specificity and of capitalism more generally, of the ways in which the optionality form displaces the commodity form as a new mode of self-valorizing value, and of the problematic politics of transitional justice, to name just a few things, have animated intellectual life and unsettled existing assumptions on this campus and others. Professor Meister's magisterial book, After Evil, A Politics of Human Rights, or Columbia University Press 2011, was even the sole subject of an undergraduate seminar on this campus. And we expect this new book to gain deserved recognition and traction along the same lines as well. We're also pleased to welcome Professor Meister's interlocutors today. Sanjay Seth has published in the fields of modern Indian history, political and social theory, post-colonial theory, and international relations. He's particularly interested in how modern European ideologies and modern Western knowledge more generally travel to the non-Western world and what effects this had both on the non-Western world and on our modern Western knowledge. His current work is focused on whether the presumptions that inform our modern knowledge production are universal, meaning adequate to all times and places, as is usually supposed by the term, or whether there are in fact parochial presumptions that are specifically modern and Western, but that illegitimately pass themselves off as universal. He often uses his Indian artifact to raise and pursue these broad social, cultural, and epistemological questions. In addition to a number of articles and edited volumes, Professor Seth is the author of two books, Marxist Theory and Nationalist Politics, The Case of Colonial India, that's New Delhi Safe Publications, 1995, and Subject Lessons, The Western Education of Colonial India, Duke University Press, 2007, with the Indian edition with Oxford University Press, India, 2008. And for that latter book, he received the International Convention of Asian Scholars 2009 Book Prize in the Social Sciences. Karen Kanor Satina is the Otto Borchett Distinguished Service Professor, jointly appointed in anthropology at the University of Chicago, so in sociology and in anthropology. Professor Kanor Satina is interested in financial markets and knowledge and information, as well as in, the, in globalization, theory, and culture. Her current projects include a book on global foreign exchange markets and on post-social knowledge societies. She continues to do research on the information architecture of financial markets, on their global micro microstructures, the global social and cultural forms these markets take, and on trader markets in contrast to producer markets. She also studies globalization from a micro sociological perspective using an ethnographic approach, and she continues to be interested in laboratory studies, in other words, the study of science, technology, and information at the site of knowledge production, particularly in the life sciences and in particle physics. Among her most recent publications are the Handbook of the Sociology of Finance, Oxford University Press, edited with a Prita in 2011, Financial Analysis Epistemic Profile of an Evaluative Science, in C. Panic et al., Editors, Knowledge, Making Use, and Evaluation in the Social Sciences, University of Chicago Press, 2010, and the Epistemics of Information, a Logic of Knowledge Consumption, Journal of Consumer Culture, also 2010. This book salon would not be possible without the help of the staff at 3CT, especially Anna Searle Jones, 3CT's Associate Director, and an exceptional presence at the center, as well as Ryan Eckel, 3CT's newest staff member, and Skyann, and Jenny Paul. Thanks are also owed to Joe Bonnie and his teaching and technology team, 
and to the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. So without further ado now, please join me in welcoming our interlocutors and particularly in celebrating Robert Meister's book. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you all for coming. I hope to see you all friends here and appreciate your willingness to engage with this uh, book, uh, which is on, uh, on derivatives, uh, which is not something that people happily engage with very often. <laughs> That said, this book is a sequel to my earlier book, After Evil, where I criticized the idea that what comes after a history of injustice is not a revolutionary reversal of that bad history, but rather a cultural shift, a cultural shift to a discourse of human rights and of human development a discourse in which the beneficiaries of past injustice are able to join in a moral consensus that the past was evil, but only in return for the willingness of surviving victims of that injustice to accept a political consensus that the evil is past, a consensus that defers indefinitely the project of reversing or harvesting its cumulative effects, but also sets aside the question of whether those cumulative effects are seen to be a perpetuation of the injustice or even whether they need to be justified at all. Now, in the human rights discourse, what happens typically is that the present day survivors of past evil are allowed to claim a moral victory, but only because the beneficiaries of that evil get to keep their gains and to continue to compound those gains without necessarily or thereby appearing to perpetuate the injustice that they join in condemning. And much of the academic work on historical justice, also on what is now called transformational justice, is about finding new ways to give historical victims that kind of moral victory by caring for their originary trauma, which is a bad thing to have, whether the causes of it were unjust or not. Some of this work is also about reparations, about whether they should or could have been originally compensated for that loss when it occurred, and also what such compensation would be worth now based on the miracle of compound interests, which somehow suggests that the injustice is worse the more ancient it is, and that what makes it worse is how long the reparation has gone without being paid. So in the end, what happens with the literature on reparations as well which I am setting aside in this book, but implicitly uh, uh, addressing, implicitly opposing as, as it were, is that the idea of acknowledging that reparations could or should have been paid is often simply represented as a symbolic way, a symbolic way of healing the kind of intergenerational trauma, which is really seen as a kind of disability that prevents people from making better choices in the present day. None of the literature on historical justice, whether as a transformational healing process or as symbolic reparations process, to the best of my knowledge, argues that what the beneficiaries of historical injustice really got and continue to have is an option, an option to reap all or most of the upside of widening inequality and an option to be protected disproportionately from the losses when there is downside. None of the literature that I'm aware of on historical justice shows or argues that the value of that option does not simply rise exponentially with the passage of time as an unpaid debt would continue to accrue, but rather that its value fluctuates and fluctuates based on the magnitude and type of the historical inequality that continues to exist and that makes the past injustice matter. 
None of this literature argues that the political and economic inequality that does and can arise as a result of ongoing injustice becomes more salient when the political and economic situation becomes more volatile, more turbulent, and that the option of historical justice can rise in value in such circumstances, in such circumstances in which the past becomes more salient in the present. My book does that. My book does that, and my project in that book is to gain access to the cumulative gains the cumulative benefits of past injustice as they are reflected and as they are measurable in levels of widening inequality, levels of widening inequality that change the value of the option to perpetuate that injustice or not. For me, the distinctive feature of capitalism and here I differ from the decolonial turn in political and social thought, because for me, the distinctive feature of capitalism is not the originary dispossession, the originary loss that may or may not have caused ongoing psychic trauma, that may or may not continue across generations, and that may or may not have been a crime as a way, as a precondition for being traumatic. For me, the distinctive feature of capitalist accumulation of surplus value is that capitalist accumulation itself, the mechanisms, the mechanics, the machinery of capitalist accumulation is itself a just, an injustice compounding machine that links in retrospect and intertemporally the traumatic origins that may or may not have occurred to the widening gaps and disadvantages that make them matter. And this ongoingness, this ongoingness is itself an additional injustice that makes the past more or less wrong, regardless of how and in what way the originary dispossession or appropriation occurred. It is indeed this ongoingness that makes the originary loss unjust. It is indeed this ongoingness that constitutes that injustice as essentially historical in the sense that it is changing rather than historical merely in the sense that it is past. Okay. Now, my Marxist background, which is probably evident to readers of the book, <laughs> Uh, at least in one chapter. My Marxist background tells me that capitalism tends to widen pre-existing inequalities by locking in and ratcheting up appreciated gains. And that the component of injustice that is specific to capitalism is this component of injustice. And that this component of injustice is precisely what is left intact by reducing injustice to the trauma of originary loss, the trauma of originary loss while allowing the cumulative benefits arising from that loss to continue to run. And the way in which this is left intact, the way in which beneficiaries get to keep their gains is through the liquidity of the assets in which appreciated assets are held. So my new book, presents post-Cold War financialized capitalism as essentially the, the material side of the humanitarian view that I criticized in After Evil, and argues that a revolution can be defined for analytical purposes as functionally equivalent to an event of capital market illiquidity, an event of disaccumulation that would in effect wipe out or reverse the cumulative component of historical injustice, but without making much if any of it available for redistribution. And that paradoxically, and this is part of the political argument in the book, capital markets now assert their political power within modern states 
precisely by threatening to bring this kind of illiquidity on themselves, to bring on themselves an event of disaccumulation in order to enlist political support for the preservation of wealth that is accumulated in the form of financial assets. So monetary issuance in support of capital market liquidity, which is what happened in 2008, 2009, and again in 2000, 2021, is considered to be non-inflationary as liquidity support if asset prices continue to rise, but the price of goods and services does not. And preventing any crisis from becoming a liquidity crisis is what now enforces the hegemonic power of finance in our political system. And by doing so, it deepens the cumulative effect of historical injustice and widens pre-existing inequality. So in my framework as developed in this book, Financial markets exist to manufacture alternatives to illiquidity in ways that are parallel to the ways in which democratic politics exist to manage alternatives to revolution. And my argument is an attempt to bring these two processes into convergence so that the objection that neither illiquidity nor revolution is possible in capitalist democracies is precisely a way of acknowledging that the work of the joint work of finance and democracy is to make this seem so, is to make this seem so. In other words, what has happened in the cultural and epistemic shift that financialization brings about is that capital markets and democratic political systems, and we're seeing this today, have learned to benefit from the perception of their own contingency. They have learned to benefit, that is to say, by denaturalizing their own processes and by taking short positions on themselves and then cashing in when liquidity is restored with apparent democratic acquiescence the truth that underlies these, this particular convergence allows them to essentially compound and accelerate the uh, accumulation of wealth and the widening of equalities. So both financial value and its intrinsic vulnerability, its intrinsic contingency are ultimately rooted in the non-impossibility of both illiquidity and revolution on which capitalist accumulation increasingly rests in a financial aid. Both illiquidity and revolution, that is to say, lie just over the horizon of possibility imposed by the capitalist imagination. My book thus treats financialization of capitalism as capitalism's thus far successful immune response to the contagion of left politics in the 1970s, a response that has allowed capitalism to benefit since the 1980s from any turbulence that threatens its continuation by reducing the value of justice as an option to near zero, while at the same time increasing the cumulative value of historical injustice that is accelerated by the appreciation of asset values and bolstered by the state's commitment to protect asset values from decline in order to protect against illiquidity. I say in the book, the growing belief that the financial system must not be attacked when its weakness might have been leveraged suggests that financialized capitalism may have ultimately trumped the project of historical justice. This happened in 2008 when the support for asset values became indistinguishable from the support for capital market liquidity. It happened at three times the same level in 2020 uh, because the financial markets were not blamed for COVID uh, in response to COVID. And when there was some income support 
we now see that financial markets are describing what happened as inflationary, unlike the 80% growth in asset values that these same interventions brought about. So what I argue in the book, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to a close here, and I don't hear what uh, my friends have to say, is that essentially what would happen in a financial market in which there is liquidity protection through asset price support normally is that the protection would normally be considered to be a put, a guarantee, a, 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 a form of insurance that would come at a price. If you pay $1,000 for a car, the fact that the car is worth $1,000 doesn't mean that you can get $1,000 for it unless you buy both the car and the money back guarantee. And a portfolio, including both the car and the guarantee, is worth more and should cost you more than the car. So my argument basically is to take this concept that liquidity premiums exist and add value and talk about precisely what the option of revolutionary disaccumulation is still worth when it can't be exercised, but has to be rolled over in the, force of, in the, in the form of a financial guarantee. And the argument that I make based on the work of several number of distinguished uh, uh, you know, macroeconomists, uh, Nobel Prize winners, and, and uh, 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 you know, international bank officials, and so forth, is that the guarantees, the put that was provided in 2008 uh, in order to protect $76 trillion of credit market debt, five times GDP, would have been worth about the value of the GDP that the government pledged to back that commitment, an amount that could have supported universal basic income through Fed accounts, health care, Green New Deal, child care, higher education, and still left some money over if a justice-granting state had collected that premium. But the conclusion of my book is that we don't have a justice-granting state. So the book then continues to talk about what justice-seeking subjects in a non-justice-granting state can do to raise the value of the liquidity premium, which my book sets at par with the value of justice as an out-of-the-money option in times of rising inequality and heightened political and economic turbulence. The argument that I make is analogous to an argument that could be made about 20th century capitalism in which the option of bringing about illiquidity in the accumulation of wealth uh, that took the form of the means of investment and the means of production uh, through a general strike which was never actually an exercisable option. It was based on, on, on the possibility of choke points and sabotage, uh, that that possibility actually led to a class compromise in which one third of GDP or up to that amount went to support the welfare state. I think the capital market illiquidity is a choke point in financialized capitalism that can also be affected by collective action that combines elements of sabotage with practices of democratic legitimation. I think something similar could be done in order to redirect or divert some of the wealth of society that has accumulated in a way that would allow it to be redirected, but not require that all that bad history go to waste. I think all of this can happen if justice once again becomes a matter. Now we'll hear from Sanjay Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be asked to comment on what's fascinating, original, and important for justice is an option. And I'm going to do what I normally do in these circumstances, which is to rephrase what I take to be the core arguments and insights of a book into my own words. Um, the 
upside or the advantage of that is, well, there's an advantage in it to me. I praise the book in order to better understand uh, why it's significant. Um, there might be upside for those of you who have not yet read it or fully read it. The downside, of course, is the danger of redundancy, especially when the author is already present and has talked about his book, but we will see whether my comments are indeed redundant. The book's focus on finance is indicated by its subtitle, A Democratic Theory of Finance for the 21st Century. And the book is indeed centrally concerned with finance and macroeconomics, and also with some discussion of microeconomics. And it displays an impressive mastery of detail and an enviable capacity to summarize complex arguments and debates regarding finance, uh, liquidity, debt, and other macroeconomic subjects such that they become comprehensible or largely comprehensible even to a layperson like me. But it is not just or even a book about finance. It ranges very widely, but its central and unifying coordinates, at least in my reading of the book, are twofold. Marx's critique of capitalism and the question or the questions of justice and injustice. On the first, Bob writes, Bob writes, drawing upon the Marxist tradition. And one of the animating questions of his book, in his own words from the book, is how to restate Marx's critique of capitalism in terms that allow its extension to an era that is defined by hyper-profitable and ubiquitous manufacture of specifically financial products that have no use other than to remain liquid under various scenarios of future risk. And the second animating and unifying concern is justice. To quote Bob from the book again, after near 50 years of teaching and writing on Marx, I've come to understand that my job all along has been to put the option of historical justice back on the table for both academic political economy and insurgent political practice. Now, I wanna work as it were almost backwards and ask if the animating concerns of the book are Marx and the critique of capitalism and the question of justice and injustice. Why then do they find their focus or point of application in finance, in the arcane, or to me at least, the arcane world of putting, shorting, derivatives, and the like? I want to suggest from my reading of the book that there's a general reason and also a number of more specific reasons. The general reason and this is a critically important insight that Bob attributes amongst others to his friend and collaborator, Randy Martin, is that, and I quote, financialization has been an ongoing, has been an organizing metaphor and worldview for describing our present way of life in much the same way that commodification was. The point being made here is much more than the preponderance of finance capital, a point that had been made by Lenin, Hilferding and others more than a century ago. There's something much more substantial being said here, which is that financialization has penetrated and transformed everyday life. It's not just that somewhere in a distance, finance capital, as in, you know, when, when Lenin is right, that forces working behind our back are having an enormous impact on us. Uh, because of the fusion of fina financial and industrial capital with financial capital dominant under monopoly conditions. Rather than operating behind our backs, it has now penetrated our innermost desires, the way we live our lives, the way we make decisions, and so on and so forth. We have been transformed into financialized subjects in the same way as two odd centuries ago, we were transformed by a world of commodities and and, and accordingly, the way in which we lived our lives, our quotidian lives, also changed. You know, we live by our credit ratings, to give but one example, and we often sometimes buy in order to establish or to strengthen this. These, in many other ways, student debt, the sort of calculation you make in trying to decide, is it worth my going into debt for so much? You know, will, will the rate of return on this, what is the likelihood of a rate of return? How long will it take to cancel out the debt that I've incurred if indeed it does at all? What is the risk that it won't at all? What hedge can I take against that risk being realized and so on and so forth? All of these have become aspects of everyday life 
for millions, even billions of people, at least in the richer capitalist countries. And it's a phenomenon that I venture to say, while it's present everywhere, is most marked in the United States. I know just, just a little aside, a long time ago, I, I lived in the US when I was much younger, briefly, and um, my partner and I, our biggest problem was getting the credit rating. I mean, yeah, we, could, we couldn't do anything we discovered because we'd come from abroad and we didn't have any credit and we were young and we didn't own it. Um, even J, I remember the most humiliating moment that JC Penny, you know, who had these big signs up saying, look, we'll give credit to anyone. <laughs> well, apparently we, we didn't even fit under the category of anyone because they took all our details and then said, no, sorry, uh, no, no you, you have to buy goods here with cash. Um, so the reason for the focus on finance, to retrace what I was saying, I'm, I'm turning it around and saying that the way I read the book is not that Bob is obsessed with derivatives, although he might be. It's not principally that Bob is obsessed with derivatives. It's that he wants to develop an analysis of capitalism in the 21st century, drawing upon Marx, and that he thinks the question of justice and injustice are things that should never have gone away if they did, and they remain, need to remain central to our intellectual as well to, as to our practical and our political world. With these animating concerns, he nonetheless puts finance at the center of his analysis. And I think the most general reason why, in a moment I'll get to some specifics, the most general reading reason why is, is an analysis of capitalism in, in the way that Lenin said, we have to rethink what we understand by capitalism um, in, in the early decades of the, well, the first decade and just after of the 20th century, so too, accordingly, we need to fundamentally re-understand the nature of contemporary capitalism and its effects upon the nature of contemporary life. The more specific reasons for connecting the interest in Marxism and justice to the topic of finance, liquidity, and derivatives, which is intimately connected with the more general reason I've just briefly downgraded, are, as I mentioned earlier, multiple. There's more than one. If finance is so central to contemporary capitalism and has reshaped the operations of institutions and of everyday life, then any anti-capitalist project must work out ways of intervening in this sphere. Bob argues that there are possibilities here, just as the centrality of coal in an earlier moment in the historical development of capital constituted a choke point where organized labor could intervene. So financialization provides possibilities for struggle. Since financial derivatives themselves now function within capital to give it a sort of immunity from infection, Bob writes, an anti-capitalist politics operating through finance must try to provide an autoimmune response from capital in the form of an outbreak of illiquidity in capital markets. I don't know whether we intended it or not, but the, the, the language of um, immune and autoimmune is of course peculiarly appropriate in this current moment. Mm -hmm. In short, the capacity to create social disruption or volatility for financial markets may itself be something that revolutionary movements or organized labor or more generally those opposed to capital can make use of. I'm going to end by posing some questions to Bob about the potential of intervention and also about the meaning of justice. So to conclude, there are some very interesting, if somewhat elliptical remarks, indicating that the peculiar temporality of derivatives, present investments specifically with an eye to an uncertain and unpredictable future, are in some odd way consonant with a project that insists that political injustice is not just past. And that to that extent, financialization might by its very nature or character or structure afford more rather than as people on the left normally tend to think, rather than fewer opportunities for intervention by the left. And time and inclination allowing, I'd like Bob to elaborate on that, especially on that question of temporality, which, which comes up at certain points in the book. Um, also, I'd like to hear more about crypto and, oh, and oppositional strategies. You give an example of climate change and the way in which 
at once climate change can itself become something that financial markets you know hedge and bet and put against but at the same time there's an argument to the effect that there is actually a potential here to disrupt those financial markets and i'd be interested if, if you could elaborate on that and finally an observation and a question in a book that's marked by a certain precision that constantly doesn't take core concepts for granted, but rather meticulously and rigorously explicates and interrogates them. This doesn't happen by and large for the master concept of justice. Um, the meaning and value of this term or aspiration is largely assumed. And this is all the more surprising given Marx's well-known scorn for terms like justice, morality, which are, of course, things you're well aware of. So I'd be interested in your elaborating, especially given your indebtedness to Marx and working within the Marxist tradition, why you think justice is the appropriate vo vo vocabulary in which to think through this project in a way that Marx arguably did not. I'll end there. Now we'll hear from Professor Knorr Sakina. Yeah, so I am pleased to be here, uh, pleased to have agreed to read the book. I think it's an amazing book in terms of comprehensiveness of knowledge of working through the literature in several fields, not just in one, of uh, seriousness of discussion and of clarity of discourse. The discourse is actually very clear, very understandable. Uh, and it's a, a recommendation I make to our graduate students to take this book as, as an example for their dissertation. It's, it's, it's like what Marx needed three volumes for, I think Bob has put in one. And he added in some recommendations about how to put this whole thing into practice, uh, which you know Marx needed several articles for. So I, I think on that level, it's just uh, I'm, I'm all admiration, and it's a difficult to criticize book, if that's it's if that's to some degree our task here, because Bob foresaw most of the counter arguments, and even if he didn't completely eliminate them from the table, he did he did mention them and address them. So I, I will nonetheless lean in and raise three issues that I that have been lingering with me after reading the book, questions really to Bob. And um, the first question I have uh, is connected to what I just said about the comprehensiveness of this book and what you said about his working through Marxism, not just Marxism, but pre-Marxism and post-Marx post literature up to the present including our very own critical theorist here, Moish Poston, for example. So he worked through all of that um, in order to arrive in chapter four uh, at, his own, at his own theorizing, at his own theory. And he states there that the production of liquidity through financialization has an internal logic that tends to widen pre-existing wealth and income inequality without going through the wage relationship. That's the Marxian uh, uh, labor theory of value. Uh, uh, so I, I read this sentence to assert a break in the foundational mechanisms uh, and following from that in the market form, and in the functioning of capitalism, a transition, if you will, or if a, a, a transformation completed in the 20th century that led from industrial capitalism tied to producer markets to financial capitalism based on financial markets, which don't work in the same way as producer markets. So this is a transformation theory claim and assertion uh, uh, with which I fully agree. We, we, we do have this transition, even if it happened in a way that doesn't destroy the industrial side of the economy completely. We do have this transition. Uh, and my question is, why then go back to Marx that extensively? Bob says things about this in the book, uh, 
But I believe one could agree and could argue equally plausibly that a new framework of theorizing for a new time is allowed to start from the occurrence of the transition. Uh, and while we can give Marx credit for his unique understanding of industrial capitalism, uh, uh, we may need to argue not just for an updating of Marx as Bob, da, the Bob does at times, but for leaving him behind. This might just might give Bob's thesis a wider reading among economists, and they should be drawn into the picture because they would have something to say about the option, uh, option complex option working behind the scenes in favor of reducing inequality, uh, and also political administrators and others which just could be important for implementing any of the ideas. So I did want to re-raise the question, why Marx Bob, or why so much Marx, and why not simply Meister? <laughs> you do it <laughs> anyway. So you could, you could uh, frame the book differently, but you haven't done it, so that, that is one of my questions. The second question, if we do start with a transformation premise, a transformation of society, as I believe Bob does, then the next question would be, what are distinctive features of the transformation? Here, I do in fact not agree with Bob when he says, and I go back to what I already quoted, the production of liquidity through financialization has an internal logic that doesn't go through the wage relationship. I think what could also put forward what's crucial for the new period and what's produced in huge amounts compared to previous times through financialization, not as liquidity, but as credit. And that that would be something somewhat more fundamental uh, to and underlying the transformation uh, than liquidity itself. Bob, in his uh, engagement with Marx, calls liquidity a fatal blind spot in Marx and in Marx scholarship. So liquidity surely is implicated in market crashes. One thing that disappears when a market crashes is liquidity. Uh, but uh, what may need to lead to bailout and what does to lead to bailout is when the credit aspect or a credit market breaks down and not just any market. For example, we had a period just a few years ago for several years when the Swiss went back to fixing in practice, not in through regulation, the exchange rate. The uh, uh, SMB, the Swiss National Bank, interfered in financial markets all the time to keep the exchange rate for the Swiss bank fixed five years or so in a row. Why did they do that? It doesn't matter here. But what matters is that it wasn't possible during that time to profit from doing deals in Swiss dollar transactions or Swiss euro transactions. When, if, whenever the Swiss franc was involved, it wasn't volatile enough. It was not fluctuating. It didn't reflect anything. It was a fixed ex exchange rate regime. So sometimes you disappear liquidity on purpose uh, uh, on the political side uh, with good reasons, sort of, but uh, it certainly eliminated speculation and profit making in Swiss banks for a while. So who would really suffer immediately if the currency markets went back to fixed exchange rates? You also address this a bit in the book. It's not clear that it would, if we find other means of uh, dealing with, with, uh, with um, uh, uh, trade imbalances uh, and uh, the, the, the value of a particular currency in international trade, then in fact, exchange rates could, at least for a while, remain completely fixed. And it, it would eliminate it one of the most important speculative bubbles that exist, because most of exchange rate trading is really speculation. Uh, so um, uh, we have a very deep financial system in uh, late capitalism today. It has, financialization has hugely intensified uh, and credit is not only at the core of finance, 
but it's the mother of all financial markets, as Henwood put it once. When credit is easily gotten and when interest rates are low and falling or falling, the financial markets typically sizzle. When credit is scarce and rates are high and or risky, financial markets do badly. A credit bubble is quite different from a bubble elsewhere in the economy, he says. We are accustomed to thinking of an of a financial bubble and crashes in terms of specific markets like junk bonds, commercial real estate, tech stocks, overpriced assets are like poison mushrooms. You eat some, you get sick, you learn to avoid them. A credit bubble is different. Credit is the air financial markets please. And when the air is poisoned, there's no place to hide. I don't want to extensively continue to raise this topic, but I do want to say that uh, uh, Keynes had a lot of interesting things to say about credit. For example, that you need it before production. You do not wait until you have savings in order to have the money to set up a factory, for example. You need credit first. And uh, interestingly, in the US, historians of finance found that actually the availability of credit that was in about 1700, um, 1770 or so, the availability of credit hugely expanded for 30 years. And after these 30 years, credit was available uh, in a uh, substantial to a substantial degree. And that was before the railroads and industrialization set in fully in the US. So the, 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 the Keynes, Keynes argument is validated by historical research, but Keynes scholarship also had something else to say about credit and I always found, found that very important. Uh, uh, credit is a time machine. It allows you to build the future in the now. If you have credit, you don't have to wait until you're 65 and can afford a house. You can have it now. You don't have to wait this education until you are able to finance it yourself. You can have it when you need it, when you are 18 and up to 24. So I think some of the appeal of finance goes beyond the gains that would be specified within a Marxian framework as injustice and also this in other frameworks as injustice, it also goes in that direction of what credit makes possible for us in financial capitalism, where only 30%, even before the turn of the century in the US of credit came from traditional loans and more than 70% came from uh, financial markets. So I'm asking, why liquidity? Does it really have to be liquidity? It seems like a superficial uh, uh, a phenomenon that is happening off and on, but isn't getting quite at the core of the issue, which appears to be according to uh, economic thinking, actually, credit rather than uh, 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 simply liquidity. My last um, question uh, 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 turns to the remedies that Bob uh, proposes, turning a finance-centric centric approach uh, into a, a mechanism that helps uh, justice and that would make it possible for injustices in the past to be uh, uh, repaired, or at least to some degree relieved, let's say. Um, I have, um, I have an uneasy feeling about this remedy. And one of the uneasiness, all but most of them come because I'm a sociologist and not an economist and not a political scientist and not a philosopher. So in sociology, we know that lay traders and day traders on average and in the long run do badly. They always lose money. They are just not up to the need today of immense knowledge, continuous observation and information about financial markets in order to do anything in them. They cannot do that. It requires a lot of learning and especially that group about which Rawls talks in his theory of justice, you know, the most disadvantaged 
you know, they don't have the education, they don't have the time, they don't have the means to actually participate in a situation where you would use options, uh, real options, uh, not, not just metaphorical options, uh, against the financial system. Now, what would develop, of course, would be intermediaries, advisors who do that for you. And these advisors, as we know, don't have in the US big fiduciary responsibilities. You know, they can they work for their own gain and they sell what they can sell and, and creates the greatest benefits for them. So you introduce another layer of potential exploitation in the financial system through uh, charging those who are most in need of justice with um, engaging in the auctions trade. I also think that some countries, and this is a, a genuine question to also to Bob, um, um, the literature on comparative capitalism, uh, much of it is relatively organization oriented, but some of it is not. We have made many varieties of capitalism in the world right now. Uh, and one variety is uh, happening in the Nordic countries or in Sweden, for example. So what happens in Sweden? It's not just a welfare state regime like we have here to some degree or in Germany to some degree. Uh, it is uh, uh, the attempt to institute egalitarianism and solidarity as a political goal. As a political goal, the policies have to pursue, and it's pushed through, not only with the help of taxes, taxes are an important part of it, uh, but it's also pushed through with other rules and means. For example, cutting the inheritance chains. The wealth cannot be inherited. You cut, you interrupt the, these chains of accumulating injustice by, on the one hand, imposing a huge inheritance ta uh, uh, tax, which is really huge. Quite frequently, people cannot take the inheritance. The inher the, the, your offspring cannot take the inheritance because you would have to pay in order to take over the house rather than to inherit uh, wealth. But in addition, uh, for example, children, youth are um, encouraged by law. There's laws which, which allow them to be for themselves and not in the family, yes. settled in the family until they are 18 or something. Uh, you may not agree with that, but it is by law possible you know, for young, younger children not, but for children over 12, it is possible to leave the family and live in communes of youngsters. In, what it does, I think, is cuts these inheritance ties again. And also, there are youth camps and stuff like that through which these youngsters are, how should I say, pre-educated, you know. Solidarity becomes a value for them through the sort of youth camp learning in their spare time, not official learning in schools about how you behave with each other, with other members of society. Uh, again, this is a model that goes quite far. And by the way, during the financial crisis, Sweden took over the banks. The government took over the banks, as you know, probably. <laughs> it did not bail them out. It did not send money their way such that they could continue to pay the CEOs the huge amount of money they'd earned before the financial crisis. That was one of the most offensive features of the bailout, I think, that happened in the US. The, the government took over the banks for a number of years, and, and, and uh, uh, I don't know how exactly and what they did, but they took them over and did not leave them in the hands of the elites that had brought about the financial crisis. So my question is, would that also be models for um, relieving some of the inequalities and the injustice that has happened? Uh, and uh, do we need to study these models and their consequences and see 
what are they leading up to? Are they leading to a situation that's better or are they not leading to a situation that's better? Would it be worthwhile doing that? And it all works through taxes, but not only through taxes. A lot of other features are in the picture, and particularly the inheritance cutting, which I personally find quite difficult to swallow. <laughs> Even though I inherited nothing, so it's not because I, I, I live on inheritances, but I find it hard to take on some level. But, you know, it is a model that tries to do justice in a better way than we do it in the US. I stop here. I have talked long enough. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Now, I, I meant to mention as well that Nikolai Vea, our PhD student and political theory, is going to field questions from Zoom. Before we get to questions from the audience in Zoom, I'd like to get Bob to respond a bit. But Bob, I'm going to cut you off at one point because I want the audience to get involved as well. So if you wouldn't mind responding to some of the questions now and then maybe in 10 minutes or so, we'll open it up. Okay, well, first of all, I just want to thank you both for reading the book so carefully and 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 getting something from it. When, whenever I look at it, all I see are typos. And so there are about I, I counted about seven questions, and I I I, I can't. I don't, there wasn't time to address all of them and still have questions from 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 the Zoom. But let me what. Why Marx? Why not credit? What about the remedies? Why not taxes? Uh, Karen's questions, heterotemporality, what, about, what do I mean by justice? Uh, and um, um, the cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, Sanjay's question. Let me try to tie them together with, with one word, which is collateral. My criticism of Marx, and this really does come partly from Keynes, who introduced the concept of optionality through his notion of liquidity preference. That's where it comes from. So this is a Keynes and Marx book. And the question here, which is Marx's blind spot, is that commodity exchange, the exchange of things for payment, is both a utility swap and a liquidity swap. And what I mean by that is something that could be explained pretty simply. The question that Marx teaches us to ask that the classical political economists didn't is how capitalism can be both endogenously funded in the sense that it creates the funding for what it does, that finances what it produces, and how capitalism can in turn fund the demand for what it produces. The simple barter model is that, you know, you purchase something that somebody happens to have with money that somebody happens to have, but how it got produced and how they got the money is exogenous to the picture. Other side of the picture, the other extreme, which is what Marx is working with when he calls his book on the commodity capital, is that you can fund your purchase of the commodity by borrowing against it. And you can fund the purchase of the commodity by borrowing against it because you can collateralize your funding with the commodity you purchase. Now, what this means is, and this is really where Keynes on Credits. This is why I do derivatives. Where Keynes on credit is orthogonal to Marx and needs to be introduced into Marx is that every commodity has two prices. One is price as a commodity, 
and secondly, its value as collateral. And the question about capitalism that Marx teaches us to raise, and this is why Marx, and then we'll get to why justice, but why Marx is that there is a spread, typically, between the degree to which any purchase can be self-funded by treating what you purchased as collateral for the funds that you use to purchase it. Now, the spread between the value of a commodity as a commodity and its value as collateral is a measure of liquidity. And it is the thing that options hedge. So what we are talking about when we are talking about credit markets is the way in which derivatives make credit markets liquid by hedging the spread between spot price of a commodity and essentially its liquidity, which is a reflection of how volatile that price is and how difficult it will be to count on being able to get your money back with the collateral. Start out with the idea that you are trying to create a continuum between markets that are internally self-funded in the sense that all purchases can generate the funds that you pay for them. And at the other extreme, the notion of wage goods in which precisely they are not investments and are not self-funding except now when economic inequality is making the case that what wage goods, as Sanjay points out, are buying, are buying specifically financial products. And then you can ask, what is going on here? And what is going on here? And this is what I mean by financialization and what I'm studying now and raised in the book is that you are getting this world, this financialized world in which the liquidity of credit is being brought about by creating facilities that are over collateralized and fully self-funded. So that yes, what is going on is entirely, and what went on in, 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 uh, uh, in 2008 and, 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 and what has continued now is about credit markets, but it's about the liquidity of credit markets and their tendency to become increasingly self-collateralizing, in which liquidity is now created by private, by, by, by private entities, by private entities using fully collateralized loan facilities. Now, this is what is going on with stablecoin. Essentially, it's going on as a form of private issuance through the credit markets using the equivalent of derivatives on tokens. But it's also the same thing that is going on in the shadow banking system. The shadow banking system is essentially an outsourcing of the issuance of money against government created collateral, which is over collateralized so the government can no longer regulate liquidity creation but is required to collateralize it. And it is collateralized through creating derivatives. Now, the issue here connects to lots of things connect, uh, related to justice, but the people who are criticizing this approach to finance, this notion that private money creation is indistinguishable from over-collateralized lending. The issue is, you're never gonna fund green development this way. Or rather, you're never gonna fund green development unless you can go back to the notion of wartime finance and government issuance of currency. Because in order to fund green development, and some, some scholars have written about this, the Wall Street consensus and so on and so forth, you have to find some way of over collateralizing the development projects, which involves politically de-risking them. 
So the serious issue is whether or not this form of financialization as over collateralized lending, which is the thing that Marx implies but doesn't discuss that Keynes lets us see, is a source of endogenous funding that allows you to begin to think about remedies. Now, lots to talk about, uh, about remedies, of course, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the counter argument that people would have to know too much about derivatives to know how to benefit from the, the liquidity they create is that everybody is now doing crypto and doing derivatives on crypto. Uh, comparative stuff, why go to Marx? Well, it's because of the end of media funding. Uh, credit, um, it's the liquidity of credit that uh, allows you, that, that creates the need for derivatives on the spread between commodity as collateral and the commodity price. Uh, and justice, well, justice is the thing I studied when I was a student. I was, I was present in the room for Rawls and Nozick. And what I learned was that justice was about the tension between liberty and equality and had nothing to do with value. And what I'm doing is bringing value theory into the theory of justice, but bringing value theory into the theory of justice through the concept of options. And this approach as an approach to justice, and I barely touch on it in the book, uh, but this approach as an approach to justice is intended as a critique to the capabilities approach. Intended as a critique to the capabilities approach, which is basically connected to the crown of view that, 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 that justice is an, as a disability, injustice is a disability that prevents you from being able to attach a story to your own body but it's a form of writer's block. What I'm trying to do is to talk about the real value of choices that don't correspond to opportunities, which connects to a lot of the things I wrote 10 years ago on higher education, where I talked about a lot of these MOOCs as out of the money options to graduate from universities you'll never be able to attend, which have value in third world countries and so on and so forth. The real question I think is the value of your options rather than the trauma that makes you incapable. And I am trying to bring options theory back to a concept of justice that, that doesn't reduce it to capabilities as, as for example, uh, you know, uh, Sen and, and, and Nussbaum do. Uh, that's probably all I have time for. At the moment, you're gonna get way more time, I promise, but that was actually perfect. 610. Thank you very much for Bob, that remarkable response. And now let's open it up to a very patient audience and uh, so, so thanks, thanks so much, Bob, for the book and for this. Um, I had I had, I guess, four things to ask. So, so the first is that and they want to read as this is an option alongside after the evil that's your work for us. The first thing is that I see you across the books making two key moves. The first, which you make here, is that financialization rather than commodification is structuring the logic of contemporary capitalism. And this was your, and what that does to dynamics of surplus value generation. And this was your debate with March for Stone. And you're locating this out of a post 1970s moment. The second, which you make in After Evil, is that human rights discourse, rather than revolution, comes to be the idiom and logic through which past historical injustice is addressed. And here you're reading this through Nuremberg, but also through the South African Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Right? And I see an utter brilliance of this as a conjunctural argument. And sometimes I read it thus, right? As here is a historical confluence of forces and relations of production, and it materializes in these modes of capitalist accumulation and undemocratic governance. But there's also a risk of reading this as a stagist argument, right? As, as, as sort of 
a diagnosis in your work of financialization as something irrevocably taking over commodity logics of capital. So that financialization becomes not a supplementation, but a supplantation of commodity-based logics of surplus value generation. And so, so the first question is, how do you offer this to us as a conjunctural reading, which allows for the possibility of an ongoing and contingent politics and history, rather than a stages reading with all of its risks? And, and just to elaborate on that a bit, I think this is tied into the question of the global, and that's where I really want to go here, right? Which is, where is financialization, not just as epistemologic, but as practice generated? And where and how does it differentially materialize? Right? So I'm absolutely convinced that it's a sort of hegemonic, even dominant logic of our times as we see, but does it differentiate or materialize differentially as it globalizes? Right? That's the second, the second point. So that leads to the third point, which is actually the major point that I grappled with in after evil, and that's my critique of it, right? Which is that well, I'm absolutely taken by your analysis of how human rights become hegemonic in the 1990s, and also fully agree with you about the limits and failures of the TRC. There's a way in which, in after evil, in your rendering, human rights discourse becomes a homogenous entity that emerges out of Europe and then blankets the world, right? And it blankets and it takes over the logics of something like the TRC. And that's the point that that I disagree with there because transitional justice experiments in places like South Africa are not simply derivative of human rights logics developed out of European histories, but are deeply situated historical experiments that replicate, repudiate, sometimes supplement European human rights discourses in all sorts of complicated ways. And therefore, finally, sort of the fourth point is what is the theory of the state here, right? And so, I see, I, I see where you're coming from when you say the state is a non-justice granting state, but sometimes the state desires to be a justice granting state and nonetheless fails to be so. And I think that's the post-apartheid South African state, right? And so a major reason that the DRC failed to achieve justice could be because of the ultimately non-revolutionary nature of a transition based in human rights rather than redistribution. But it also was because of a series of state economic policies, especially by the Nbeki government, that were enacted, that were directly antithetical to its own constitutional aspirations. And this was explicitly and specifically because of fears of capital fight. And that, for me, is the historical point of intersection of after evil and justice as an option, as grounded in sort of post-colonial histories of the global south. So the provocation is how might we resituate the story out of the post colony as a way to render this a conjunctural rather than a stages history? But the provocation is that if we do so, then the theory of the state becomes a potentially more complicated one that might have to open us up to the possibility of a non revolutionary politics towards the post colonial state as well, and yet one that's deeply attended to how it's captured by financial. Let's pour yes, please. Please answer. There's four questions. <laughs> That's why I want to give people time. Uh, four great questions. Um, you can choose some of them now. Let me let, let, let me let me take them in in reverse order. Um, there are justice-seeking states. I understand exactly what you mean that fail because of their relation to the global financial system and because of the problem of capital flight. Uh, that has been a problem. It was a problem, of course, during the era of, of, of import substitution. My view is that in the age of financialization, particularly when you're talking about bond-funded development, and then uh, there's a separate issue. Uh, I'm doing an interview with somebody who's studying the the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in China, China-funded development, and and shadow banking-funded development, and the, and and, and aid-funded development. And 
in the world of shadow banking, the issue of green development is a different question because in this era, liquidity is essentially fully collateralized lending, which is a form of global private money issuance that is structurally indistinguishable from other private money issuance, uh, including private money issuance that is non-state. So now what you're looking at in, in places like, like South Africa, and I'm familiar with this because my son is involved in Latin America uh, doing similar questions, uh, dealing with similar questions, is the relationship of the state on the one hand the shadow banking system on the other hand, and the question of whether, whether any form of development that occurs, and you're not gonna address climate unless you can finance green development. And everybody who is against the shadow banking system is against it, who writes about it at least, is against it because it can't finance green development and they can't imagine how this could be done without going back to MMT and just having sovereign, sovereign, sovereign currency issue, issuers print money. But what's really happening is the shadow banking system is playing chicken with the, with, 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 uh, 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 with the global climate until green development can be assetized and de-risked politically and turned into a fully financialized self-collateralized problem. So this is this is this is this is this is the fundamental difference in the question today on your fourth point is that 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 that, that, that green development will be the money to fund green development is based on a self-collateralized finance model in which the issuance is private and the state and this and 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 and, and states provide collateral uh, and de-risk the investment. Human rights uh, discourse, uh, is it derivative? You, you, your question is really a qualification of my argument. Uh, the, 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 the key figure here uh, who confirms your qualification is, is Desmond Tutu himself, who sued the TRC for failing to provide remedies and who thought that the healing of trauma was something other than justice that precedes it rather than a substitute for justice and was disappointed precisely because that experiment turned out as I, as, 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 as I, as I said it did, uh, which, I, which I can continue uh, to think. Um, globality and differentiation, again, is a qualification on my argument, I think that these things will be different. Uh, Venezuela is going to be different from South Africa, uh, is going to be different than Russia. The question of, of sanctions and food and whether food imports can be financed uh, without being financialized uh, is going to lead people to now try to begin to revive uh, the uh, the development is aid model as opposed to the financialized development model. That's going to come back. And as it comes back, it's going to lead to a deglobalization. So what everyone is saying about what's happening now, uh, as you know, country people like Modi, for example, trying to figure out how India can deglobalize in a way that makes it no longer subject to sanctions and no longer funded by the shadow banking system. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, I mean, we're, as of the past six months or four months, we're, we're in a different world here. And uh, the fact that we are deglobalizing because of the sanctions, and for that matter, the fact that the treasury market became illiquid for two weeks in March 2020, these are big deals, which suggests that we may be at the end of the conjunctural era that I'm describing. And then it is conjunctural, of course, of course. Uh, one of my, part of my answer to, to Karen was to say, you know, 
I don't want to say now we're in the age of acidization and it's not the age of commodification. No, what we're learning now is to see that the relationship is a relationship between the degree to which commodification can be self-financing, which is to say the spread between the value of the same thing as a commodity and its ability to fund itself by functioning also as collateral for its own purchase. And what we are talking about now, what I mean by financialization increasingly, is fully self-collateralized uh, financing of credit, in which you can actually provide the credit by borrowing against the credit that you provide. And that is what I mean by financialization. Uh, and so that is a stage, in a sense, that it's something new, but it's also conjunctural in the sense that what you're doing is pricing the spread between spot price be, 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 between a commodity and and what it costs, what the haircut has to be to hedge its uh, to hedge its liquidity, and uh, and and so we're not leaving the commodity behind when we're talking about the asset. We're rather describing the. Uh, the way in which the funding of commodity purchases can be self-collateralized and the degree to which that's so, and the derivative-based uh, interpretation of credit is what has made this possible. But I think, and I think you're right here, it was transitional to the notion of fully collateralized private issuance of money, which is what has created the opening for crypto which gets back to Sanjay's question. Nikolai, are there questions on Zoom or from you? I mean, I have a question. There's a question, one question from Zoom, so I'll ask the question from Zoom first. So it's from Andy Davis. So she asks, uh, give a minute. I guess Western capitalist countries are saying Western is protecting liquidity. Is the only possibility for bursting the financial bubble that it comes from other places like she invokes Putin's Russia, from states outside the uh, outside the West. I, given that the West, I mean, I think I, mean, I think the question is given that yeah. Western countries the same Western interest in the West. Well, first of all, hello to Anne. Flattered that you're listening in. Uh, but uh, second, I mean, I think that deglobalization is going to interrupt the liquidity of shadow banking finance of third world development projects. I also think that, that deglobalization is going to make a great many financial instruments less liquid. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's the only way because I think that, for example, uh, you know, student loan protests, uh, uh, because their success was largely exaggerated, uh, uh, created investment opportunities based on liquidity spread uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, allowed allowed uh, hedge funds to uh, close the gap between uh, uh, the the apparent gap between uh, uh, a, a lower willingness to pay and an increased ability to pay. Uh, there were there were a lot of underpriced bonds. Uh, that uh, could become the basis of, of funds. And, and I think that environmental groups, environmental movements, and so on and so forth, need to understand that when they succeed, they succeed because people exaggerate their success. And the effect of people's exaggerating their success is to affect the liquidity of financial assets, for example, real estate and increase regulatory risk. So people who are going to organize in many ways need to understand that what they are doing will work if it works by creating volatility and by creating exaggerated responses to the volatility they create, which then needs to be leveraged and hedged, which is one of the reasons that I think that instead of choosing any single movement that is going to challenge liquidity globally, uh, we should think of movements as part of a portfolio 
uh, that are mutually invested in each other. And Nikolai, your question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so my question, I mean, the way related to what, what you said now, but I mean, around the question is contradiction, because contradiction is a category is very important for Marx. So, in a way, for him, the self organization of value to the commodity producing process is ultimately unsustainable because it's contradictory. Uh, I mean, what do you see the contradiction of self? I'm sorry, I couldn't. What do you see the contradiction of self? Asset appreciation. Because, I mean, in a way, I mean, this is, I guess, what and Davis' this question was getting at. In a way, now we're living with the greatest bubble, the most bubble in the history of capitalism. It's a bubble which is, I mean, people have found this, that everything bubble, right? So there's the housing bubble, the financial market bubble, the crypto bubble, right? So we've lived through this more than a decade, of the cheapest credit ever as well. So negative real interest rates, bubbles everywhere as well. And the bubble is, so, I mean, who are contained in the financial? See, right? Because the housing model, for example, who source this by nationalization, it affects people's real life very much by making housing unaffordable. So, I mean, I don't know. So, what we see the limits of this continuous asset appreciation? Because, on the one hand, it seems to be essential for the way capitalism functions now. So, it's this, I mean, asset appreciation of this bubble, and it's not just, as you said, it's not just results from the speculation of private actors. You know, the state needs to encourage. As the appreciation to maintain the machine going. Uh, but I mean, how much can it last? And I mean, to, I mean, over the last couple of months, we've seen the beginning of the inflation of the financial market powers, the creative of the So, I mean, what are the limits? I mean, what's the contradiction? Well, I mean, I would come at that question from, I mean, I can't say a priori that this has reached its limits just because it's receding. Uh, it's still higher than it. I mean, we've we've given back less than 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 than, than, than was gained uh, in, in 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 asset prices uh, over the past eight months. We've given we we we're. We've given back less than was than than was gained. I mean, it was an eighty percent eighty percent rise, and it's only a twenty percent drop. So everybody who had assets is eighty percent richer. Uh, I think the impetus for the question is not whether there whether it 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 will go up with without ever going down, uh, or even whether the state would prevented from going down uh, as soon as the suicide bombers on Wall Street threatened to blow themselves up by, 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 by declaring a liquidity crisis. I, 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 I think the, there, there are two important points here. One is that it is, it is Wall Street that benefits from stressing the fragility of the system, and that they produce bubbles when they declare a liquidity crisis, and thus far they haven't. So for me, the question is not how far it can, you know, what are the limits for it's going up, but how far it will be allowed to go down, okay? And the second point I would make is a conceptual point, that the entire epistemic revolution that I describe in the book is at the level of distinguishing between asset appreciation, decoupling asset appreciation with economic growth. And that the and 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 we see this you know all the time with housing prices. Because of course they are they are the the only financial asset that has been partly democratized, but in democratizing that asset so that it can appreciate faster than the cost of living, it has made housing, which is also a cost of living, unaffordable. Now the essence of the financial epistemic break in capitalism with Black Scholes 
has been essentially to say, asset growth is consistent with and is the foundation for liquidity expansion, which is by definition non-inflationary. So here, here, is, here is the macroeconomic conundrum, that we are in effect subsidizing asset growth as something which is distinct from stimulating consumer demand. And using the growth of assets to collateralize the issuance of funds, the endogenous issuance of funds that are used to purchase those assets. Now that is the fundamental fact that is driving the asset growth, is that the asset growth is now endogenously funded through the short-term lending market, which is over collateralized and is providing the funds that are the liquidity for the credit instruments that are being issued. So you have the cash pool, you have the rising inequality, which increases the demand for credit. You have the cash pools, which are funding the supply for credit. And then you have the production of the financial assets in which the credit market is producing wealth that can be accumulated. And those assets are self-financed. They're self-financed through a process of over-collateralization in which the state is essentially supporting the private issuance of the money that funds their purchase and supports the loans. So the inequality is producing the, the, the cash pools, the inequality is producing demands, and the financial market is essentially issuing money against collateral that it is creating. On that very dismal note, <laughs> please join me in thanking our participants and particularly Bob Meister for a wonderful engagement. I didn't answer all your questions. It's impossible with me, so it's too good.